Welcome to the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. Each week, Matt, Kurt, Jerry, and the occasional special guest explore how the trauma informed paradigm challenges traditional beliefs and approaches concerning a wide variety of areas. This podcast addresses psychological trauma in an educational manner and is not designed to replace mental health treatment. If anything in this podcast makes you feel uncomfortable or anxious, please talk to a mental health professional. Welcome, friends, to episode 70 of the Trauma Informed Lens podcast. Today, we're going to talk about autonomic regulation and cooperation. And Kurt threw that title at me because I'm sure he thought I, it would trip me up, but I think I got through it. So I was uh, thinking could, we could go psychophysiological, we could uh, go autonomic. I'm just uh, giving you four, like three, four syllable words and just seeing what happens. Regulation and cooperation. I, I did it. I'm taking the win there. So uh, we got a fascinating article to look at today. So I'm, I'm excited to get into it. But like always, we start out with our bright, shiny objects of the week. So uh, Kurt, I'll let you get us going this week. What are you thinking about? I have two related ones. Um, and first one I'll start with is uh, I tried this new uh, cycling training app from Peloton. It's awesome. <laughs> it's like you can throw it up on this great, I have this great big, big screen TV in my gym so I can watch this big TV while I'm riding my bike and it's instructor led. And oh man, it was great. I mean, it was, and it was this great workout to like 80s music. So that was my era. It was awesome. It was awesome. But that it related to that is um, thinking a lot about, I, I've done a lot of attempts at establishing a mindfulness practice. And one of the things I've really struggled with, and I'm I'm, I'm guessing that probably some of our listeners have struggled with as well. It's really hard for me to sit and be still and practice mindfulness. It's a really difficult thing for me. And so as I thought about when it's easier for me to be mindful and how cycling, when I'm so like focused in on what my heart rate is and what my internal state is and managing that is a, in essence, that's a part of a mindfulness practice. It's just that I'm active while I'm doing it. Yeah. So like me kind of wrapping my head around that and, and realizing that that can be a great way for me to practice mindfulness was really fun this week. And I really enjoyed both of those things. One, I got to use some technology and it was really fun and really enjoyable and a new thing that was kind of energizing, but also met this goal that I've been working on of getting better at being mindful and, and uh, uh, being less kind of concerned with controlling what my thoughts are more than going with the flow of my thoughts and I can do that in that active activity. So that was, a, that was a couple of real bright, shiny objects for me this week. So, so big question is uh, when you do mindfulness as exercise, cause I've done that before. I do that before too, especially if I'm being lazy uh, with my mindfulness practice before the gym, do you, do you uh, turn off the music and just focus on breathing or do you got Billy Joel singing uptown girl in the background? You could do it either way. And also can put in, if you want to do some guided mindfulness or guided imagery, just throw that on pre, like pre-workout or warm up, and then do it post too. Um, so you could just incorporate a lot of different uh, different modalities into the active mindfulness. That putting a little less structure around a mindfulness it, mindfulness activity, I think, was an important one for me to do and be like, do what works for you, and just figure out what works and and kind of follow that. So. Very cool. It's been an enjoyable awesome. week for that. Very cool. Jerry, what about you? You know, uh, this week, th there are some days you wish you had a video camera. So I was at the uh, supermarket, and um, I was watching this little, uh, probably four-year-old in the aisle, and um, – his mom was shopping and she had a, an infant and he reached up and he knocked over the display in the supermarket. And the mother turned and her facial expression, she looked like she was embarrassed. But her first response was the child was that must have been scary. And I thought she really exhibited um, this uh, ability to, one is take a moment to regulate herself, 
and two is be attuned to that, that child's state. And in a, in a supermarket that with another child, that's a pretty amazing feat. So, um, you know, watching these interactions, I, I was fairly impressed. And she wasn't on a Peloton bike. <laughs> yeah. You should have helped stack up the display. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be, that'd be I know, but I, I want to kind of put a shout out to whoever that mom was. That, that was a pretty amazing feat. I kind of observed that in vivo of being able to uh, both be able to be aware aware of her own her infant and also the needs of a four-year-old yeah so uh, kudos to that lady very cool um my, my bright shiny object of the week this week is actually a book really on this topic um and and the title of it is assessing the healing power of the vagus nerve uh by stanley rosenberg um and you know, it's, you know, I've, I've read polyvagal theory by Porges and boy, I'll be honest with you, I'm a nerd and it's kind of hard for me to get through that book at times. Um, I know I'm not the only one that has had that experience with it, but this is a very accessible book, um, both to explain the polyvagal theory and also as, as we kind of transition into the topic of how we're seeing different and I think we talk about this, but it, it was just so cool in this book to see it broken down to specific nerves um, coming out of the brain that um, are under stimulated uh, because of trauma. And we see that certain stretches and other things specifically targeting those nerves actually increase social engagement. Um, so really fascinating stuff so if you're into our discussion along the lines we've been going on and i think especially today's uh, article and episode um again it's assessing the healing power of the vagus nerve uh by stanley rosenberg uh a pretty quick uh read uh but really simplified actually has some self exercises because he acknowledges therapist um, unlike him, I, I think he's a, I always pronounce this wrong, a roof, rolfing, rolfing. Rolfing. Thank you. I, it's, I almost say roofie and that's, that would be a bad that's representation. That's a different thing. That's a different thing. Bad representation of his background. But he, he talks about this is so important for therapists and yet traditionally and ethically we haven't ever put our hands on anybody and nor are we trained to do so. So he actually gives some very simple exercises that you can do on your own and teach uh, folks um, and not necessarily have to be a therapist to do it. So uh, another really good resource in, in line with, with our learning on this topic. So uh, check it out if you're, you're interested in this. So, um, so today, uh, Kurt, uh, lead us down this rabbit hole of this article. Some fascinating well, stuff here. Well, this is one that I, uh, I, picked really intentionally, even back to when I was thinking about, you know, what kind of articles do we want to read? And I wanted to kind of lead us to this point of understanding. <laughs> we got into a lot of depth about heart rate variability and about autonomic space. And a lot of these terms like, you know, psychophysiological arousal and parasympathetic balance. And we got into a lot of real meat in there. And, and intentionally, that's kind of it's, it's some real meat to kind of get into, but also when you kind of come out of the other side of all of that reading, you, you tend to have a pretty decent understanding of the parasympathetic and the sympathetic and how they balance out in the autonomic nervous system. Even though as you go through that process, you're kind of like, I don't think I get any of this. But you find, you know, six articles later, you're like, actually, I get this quite a bit. And so I hope that a lot of our listeners have that same kind of experience as we get into something and the impact that understanding this can have. I and mean, we talked about how chronic pain can cause elevated sympathetic arousal and that that starts to have an impact on all these other brain and body systems. We've talked about, um, I especially love that article about fear conditioning, the extinction of conditioned fear, and the learning of safety cues being predicted by this measure of heart rate variability or our, the regulation and the balance of our autonomic nervous system. And then I wanted to get us into this area about, this is a very kind of traditional therapy kind of measure uh, related to the working alliance. And that's such a critical component of the therapeutic relationship. 
and you know, Jerry and I've had and I have had discussions about this, and Matt, you and I as well, about so much of the literature and and so many young clinicians coming out of out of graduate programs will latch on to this data that is predict that says all I need to do is have a good relationship with my client, and it doesn't matter what my theoretical orientation is, which is only half the story. It still matters, right? You still have to have an intervention and you still need to have like the structure and a clinical workflow and, and information gathering and clinical skill. Um, all of those things are still still there, but the relationship is also a component of all of that working. And so this working alliance is this really kind of um, well-known measure in, in the therapy world and, and not understated. It's, it's incredibly important and we all want it and strive for it. And to be able to then attach what we have learned about the autonomic nervous system and the importance of um, physiological regulation and social engagement all the way to developing this working alliance was something that I kind of wanted to lead us down this road to kind of get to this point. So I'll describe what this study is, is and, and we can jump from the therapeutic relationship really quickly into normal everyday relationships from, I think, from this article. So I'm, that, I'm kind of hoping the discussion kind of goes that direction to frame all of that. Well, the study was done, um, 27 women who are all um, looking for treatment for uh, trauma-related uh, symptoms. Uh, and you look at the article, there was a really high levels of trauma in these women's history. I mean, we look at an average of about 12 distinct uh, traumatic experiences for every single participant in this study. Um, two thirds or, or even three quarters had experienced either sexual or physical abuse. And over 50% had experienced both of those experiences. So really high levels of, of traumatic exposure. Um, and then they measured their, their symptom activation. So we got a sense of how high their, or how acute uh, every participant's um, symptom acuity was going into the study. So during the course of the study, then they took some physiological measures in addition to taking a measure of working alliance. A uh, little inventory, um, not surprisingly named the working alliance inventory, which is great, aptly named. Um, and really then looked at how well these physiological measures and symptom acuity, uh, pre-therapy pre symptom acuity, was it, how much that working alliance was explained or predicted by um, their, the physiological measures. So a couple of the physiological measures, I think are some pretty interesting ones also. One is they measured respiratory sinus arrhythmia, which is RSA, which is essentially the measure of parasympathetic activation or parasympathetic tone. And then the other that they measured was uh, skin conductance. And skin conductance is essentially a measure of sympathetic activation. So you got a sense of both systems, what's the level of both uh, systems being activated within all of these subjects' autonomic nervous system. So as they looked at, they, they then exposed them to certain experiences in addition to therapy. So they looked at these two physiological measures, um, both at a baseline period, and then they showed them 10 slides for five seconds each. So a 50 second period of time where they saw uh, positive images from a bank of images that were categorized as positive, basically. Flowers, smiles, uh, sunsets, you know, a lot of images like this that, that tend to evoke some positive emotions <laughs> from most people. And, and then they should, had a 30 second break and then showed them 10 slides, another 50 seconds, so it's five seconds per slide of traumatic related imagery. And a lot of that had to do uh, with domestic violence, um, it, it, threats of physical harm, a lot of images related to that. And they measured this skin conductance and RSA during that period of time. And then they get a recovery period. And then they, they underwent uh, 12 sessions of psychotherapy and consistently measured this working alliance at the beginning of therapy and at certain points along the road and then at the end of therapy. So a couple of things that I think were interesting about this procedure that we can start to see is one, you can think about how interesting it is that something like heart rate variability or respiratory sinus arrhythmia and skin conductance level can vary um, in response to something as acute as 50 seconds of images being shown to you. Well, oftentimes we will think of these measures as being, as Matt, you've asked, is this 
a state or is this a trait? And we've kind of gone, it's both. So it can be responsive to both immediate environmental experiences and to experiences over the long term. So a highly responsive system on a couple, at least a couple of different levels. And this showed that it, it can measure both of those things and capture both of those experiences. I thought that was a really interesting part of this design. So what they basically saw is that this working alliance or the way that the patient rated their level of cooperation, their level of trust, their level of shared goals with their therapist was really, really highly positively correlated with their level of autonomic regulation. So they, the more, the higher their um, respiratory sinus arrhythmia in when they saw the trauma related slides and when they saw slides of positive images, the more they were likely to have an <laughs> alliance with their therapist. So you also saw the inverse of that being true, that if they saw traumatic images and their RSA went down, meaning their heart rate would go up, so they had less variability, they tended to have higher skin conductance, lower RSA, they were much less likely to establish a working alliance with their therapist. So that was the, really the kind of the nutshell of what they found in this study. And it started to give a little bit more um, credence to the ideas that, uh, and support to the theories that uh, social engagement is really closely connected to the way that our body regulates its, its, its stress response and its ability to, to engage with the external world. I thought it was really well designed. I thought that the, that the way that they designed the, the, the sequence of exposure um, in, the, in the study was really pretty cool how they did that. Um, and I think it, it really gave us a nice sense of how much we're doing to regulate one another on a moment to moment basis in these relational interactions. And as a therapist, I think how invaluable it, it ha has become to me to have an understanding that one of the reasons why somebody may have a difficulty establishing a working, a working alliance with me may be their stress response and that it, it can help me to inform an intervention around their stress response and help me to kind of, back off on trying to establish social engagement so quickly, I may just need to be present and, and actually just kind of regulate that person. And working on that can be towards the end of, of establishing social engagement. So that was what we kind of got from this study. At least that was, that was the, the high points that I kind of pulled out of it. Um, a couple of interventions I thought of, um, since that's, that's a question that comes up a lot, is what do we pull out of this to do as a clinical practice? And one of them I'd love to get both of your thoughts on is this idea of having kind of a, a constant measure. And it doesn't have to be an assessment. It can be asking simple questions about assessing the working alliance on how well is this relationship going and being able to continually assess that and adjust intervention just based on it. And I think that's something so simple to do um, that often as I've coached younger clinicians gets lost a lot. We're often not asking How'd this session go for you today? Like, did, this, did this meet your need? And what could we do to adjust it if it didn't? And so if we think about clinical practices as kind of takeaways, that's one that I've taken away from this study is just being able to ask that question. Um, so Matt, I'm going to toss it to you about um, motivational interviewing, some of your expertise behind that, about like, how do you go about asking that question and gathering information about the effectiveness of your intervention and your effectiveness as a practitioner? And are there some ways we could talk about doing that? Yeah, and I, I think your your example is, is a great one. I mean, we want we want to get somehow structurally, even if it's on us, is well, what is the client client patient satisfaction in services? And then there's some decent uh, standardized measures uh, for that as well. Again, I don't like to get too complex because we don't really assess everybody anyway. But but really looking towards that. I mean, one of the things that I've you know, that, that I kind of added to the traditional approach of motivational interviewing, because I think MI does a really great job of setting up the therapeutic alliance uh, with what's called the spirit of motivational interviewing, gives, a, gives you key focus areas uh, to, to really work on to establish the trust and rapport that we know actually facilitates it somewhat going through a change process. Um, so one of the things that, but looking at the mindfulness research, and I think from some of our past discussions, kind of 
the uh, regulate, relate, ration model um, of that some folks are not going to be ready to come in and connect in a very intimate way that is, you know, in the therapeutic reliance, but that could be a case manager, an outreach worker, a medical uh, uh, professional as well, because the, the intensity of those conversations uh, can be just as high sometimes as in therapy. So really it's trying to think about how do we help get that regulation piece in there. So what, what I'm thinking about putting in the context of this article is those with a higher level of dysregulation, both kind of at baseline looking at the pretty pictures and at the traumatic pictures, have a harder time, I would think, really building that therapeutic reliance with somebody. So, you know, my thought process around that as I try to, what would a trauma-informed MI be is, hey, maybe interjecting small mindfulness uh, activities in there to hopefully regulate folks before we do uh, sometimes the very intense and intimate uh, conversations we have about things like trauma, homelessness, uh, views all those things that we go on. So, you know, I, I think uh, from that perspective, uh, this is a fascinating article. I, I think there's there, there's such a jump to this conclusion, which, which I think is a strong, again, the evidence based, but, you know, what, what is all going on with the individuals to get the reading that then have trouble connecting uh, in a therapeutic situation? I, I think there's a lot of meat there uh, that, that we're, we're kind of conjecting on, but uh, some fascinating stuff to consider for sure. Jerry, I wonder your thoughts too about the other direction here about what about the therapist who has low heart rate variability and is having a hard time socially engaging with clients. And I know that's one thing that you and I've talked, heard you talk about a lot is how do we regulate the therapists and how do we regulate the staff with, with the kids or, or with the students in a classroom? Any thoughts you've got on that direction? Um, well, that was one of my reactions to it, is there was no measure of the therapist, right? And the assumption was that what was going on was in, within the client. Yeah. And what we know is, is that therapy is a bi-directional process, right? So the state of the, the state of the, especially when you're looking at situational, contextual kinds of uh, reactions. So that, that's one of the things I was thinking about. Um, and I'll, I'll address your question in a second, but the other thing I was thinking about is how complex this is, right? Is that for those people who are really interested in heart rate variability, you could find all sorts of data that suggests that that really is a key measure. But then you look at people who study the HPA axis and they say that's the, right? Or you look at people who say it's the amygdala and the amygdala is gonna, right, is that really being in a relationship and being able to both co-regulate and regulate yourself is such a complex process, right? And, and, and really in research, we try to break it down and look at these individual variab variables, but really it's an integrated process, right? And I think, you know, uh, trying to understand all those 12, you know, uh, neural uh, nerves, brain nerves, cranial nerves, yeah. um, everything is being impacted, right? Everything is being impacted. Um, and so that, that was one is one, it's looking at what's happening individual, looking at what's happening between the individual and then all the variables and within that, really, it's a, it, it's really would be very difficult to kind of put your finger on this is this is the measure we should take that could give all of those things. Sure. That, that's the sure. first thing. The other thing is, I think that this, this kind of paying attention to, um, for lack of a better word, engagement, right? Is that just because you show up to therapy doesn't mean you're engaged. And oftentimes we're, engaged, we're working with people who aren't really there because they want to be there. They have a need to get something or somebody's sending them to some place or just 10 other reasons why. And if we don't spend a lot of time really looking at this engagement process um, and realize that um, engagement is, um, 
isn't a one-time thing, right? And so if I have a higher heart rate variability today, I might be able to engage with you, but I might show up the next time and be in a very different state, Mm -hmm. right? And if I think, okay, now I've engaged you and I can move on to those other techniques that you kind of talked about, you miss out something. So really paying attention to the relational interactions, both what's happening um, between you, but also the physiological reactions in your client um, is really, really important. So if you get so caught up in just having this relationship and your person's engaged and ready to learn and you're staying there working on the relationship, you're being misattuned. But if you're so caught up in delivering your intervention and you miss that this person's not really relationally connected, you're also missing too. Mm-hmm. And so this it becomes a really important, um, this becomes a measure, but it's this process of if I, if I show up to do this therapy, is my client in the space to be able to, in some ways, benefit from this interaction? And if they're not, what has to happen in this relationship to increase the chances of them benefiting? I think those are really interesting that this article kind of touched on, (laughs) but I think it goes way beyond your heart rate variability. That's one measure of of that, right? Is I, I can look at what are the 12 other things, is this something that's going on in the person or do they come in and they just had a death in their family and they're really their resources is coming or, um, or the police in their house or they ex- exposed to some kind of violence <laughs> that goes on. So I think stopping and asking that question that this article is raising is an important part of the therapeutic process. Mm-hmm. And one of the things you were touching on that I think <laughs> we can pull out of this study is really this, the state dependent nature of, being able to socially engage. Like that was impacted even by a 50 second period of time started to change the measure um, and started to predict whether or not working alliance could be established. So that can happen so quickly, even within day, you know, from moment to moment, that's, that's continually shifting. Right, and that could be, that 50 second could have been they walked through your lobby and somebody, did, somebody didn't kind of look up and acknowledge them, right? Right. right. That, that the, the thing about trauma is trauma is everywhere, yeah. right? The cues are everywhere through it. So if it's 50 seconds, how you say hello to them when they walk in the door, how they, how you answer a telephone for them or immediately communicates something based on their worldview and their experience of those things. So that's how, especially people who have atypical nervous systems. So Matt, that brings up a question I, kind of want to kick your way and get your thoughts about <coughs> if heart rate variability changes that quickly and it can impact a client walking through an office door like what about the therapist who just got off the phone with somebody who was upset about something they did and their heart rate variability is now changed like how like thoughts about could we address that in a in a more proactive kind of way or more mindful way well, well and I would go back to the states and the trade kind of thing here. Is I think that again, and I, I know you can take a drink now because it's almost that that Wellatory Wellatory app. You know, to to get those readings. Uh, you know, I see my readings fluctuate throughout the day, and they're trending in a healthier direction. I didn't start out too bad once I learned how to take the measure right. Mm-hmm. But but I just I mean, looking at okay, what are my strategies throughout the day? in order to ensure that I have the highest heart rate variability possible. Um, And again, there's, there's, I always say self-care is a dual thing. One is what you do outside of work to bring your best self into work. And then what do you do throughout the work day to ensure that no matter if you see somebody at 3.30 or 10.30 in the morning, whether you're a morning or afternoon person, that that they get the same quality. And and I think you're exactly right, that, that tough call. Um, I see, especially, I mean, therapists, in some ways, I would say we have it easy because we get, we get like 50, 60 minute blocks of time with people, whereas folks like uh, physicians are jumping 15 minutes to the next person right away. 
And, and so no matter what you're in, I just think to take some time uh, to at least breathe yourself. You know, here's, here's this, uh, what I liked about this study too, and we've had to cut this in, I think in another study too, is that, that they're measuring heart rate variability through the breath. So just doing some two to one breathing uh, to be, I, I always challenge the folks in my self care training. How do you bring your presence um, into that moment? So you're not bringing that call in. Uh, maybe that's for some folks. Uh, I train a self care strategy where you just jump up and down and shake like a dog because we know dogs can shake off stress and, and that, that works for some people as well. I, I call it the Matt Pickleball Shakes because I use it during my favorite game when I get frustrated to shake <laughs> off a bad point so I don't bring it into the next point. So, you know, and so, I, you know, I think that, again, it's, it's how do we pay attention to our own health. The healthier we are, that will show up on our heart rate variability scores. And then how do we use small interventions uh, throughout the day? Some of those may be taking an hour for lunch. Uh, making sure that we don't do 50 minutes, then paperwork for 10 minutes, then, you know, that we do give ourselves a break in there. And I know how hard that can be in the modern helping environment when you got emails, you got phone calls to jump back and forth to. But I, I'm hoping that, that things like these apps coming out is I can do a little quick check-in to see am I ready for this next client, I'm seeing the next patient I'm going into. Um, I don't think the technology is quite there yet because the readings take a little time to get. Uh, but but I'd, I'd say in a year or so, we're gonna get there where, you know, maybe I can wear a heart monitor on my, you know, wrist, elbows, wherever, uh, that gives me some of those readings of whether or not I'm ready to engage somebody myself. And I think that's a really cool thing to be coming up. Um, now, if you're not ready and it's time to see the person, you know, what, what do you do? You can't, you can't, you know, leave for the day. But again, it gives us data and I think gives us data on ourselves in a way we've not really had it uh, historically, which I think is really cool. I was just imagining, you know, walking into your house and your significant other's waiting to talk to you and you're looking at your wrist going, yeah, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Give me, not yet. I'm almost there. Not yet. <laughs> my wife's like, oh, my God, you're taking another measurement? You think I'm, addicted to this? I'm like, I don't get much dopamine release from these measurements. I'm just trying to establish a good baseline. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, I wonder if you could give us a – unless you have a point you wanted to bring in there. No, I, I, I'm – I'm just thinking about um, some clients that I had that, you know, in a way, the, whether it's a state or a trait, for some people, this is, these are integrated. So, Matt, you talk about, I realize I'm not in this space, mm -hmm. and now I've got to do something to get out of this space. But for lots of clients that I've worked with, these states aren't integrated. So when they're in a dysregulated state, they don't know that you're not the person creating that state. They don't have an awareness that this is an internal experience for them, right, to do it. Or if they're in a good spot and you're engaged and we're doing it. And so I, I just did a consult with some, someone the other day and they said, I was with my client and they were so making such good use of, of the time we had together to do it. And they went out and they assaulted somebody, right? It's like these states are so unintegrated. And so I, I think that it's really, really important to understand that um, we all transition states and we're transitioning states all the time. But we have in some ways an integrated coherent narrative of I had a bad day and I'm coming home and darling, give me a few minutes and I could talk, but I still hold on to you, right? For many of our clients who you'll work with, that's not going to be their experience of it. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important for the therapist to understand that some of these kinds of um, transitions from fight to flight or from shutting down or from being socially engaged. Um, they're per they may look like they're really dealing with this, <coughs> this normal 
kind of apparently well, well-organized person one day. The next time somebody comes in, it looks very different. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> I think that us having these discrete kinds of measures doesn't always translate to the same way when we're dealing with our clients. Mm-hmm. It's not as pretty and clean as, as, as it <coughs> appear right. from the research study. Right. So I, I, I think it's a, it, as you talk about this 15 minutes or whatever, or a case manager, is that they may feel like they're dealing with a totally different person from one visit to the next visit. Yeah. Kurt, and, let me yeah. ask you. Let me ask you a question on this from your behavioral cause and effect sort of mentality. One of the, one of the problems I, and I won't, I won't get on a soapbox here, but one of the problems I had with this, this study was not, not the data and the insight. I thought that was really good, but you know, I, I, I really struggle with the ethics of showing people that we know are struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder from abuse, pictures of people being abused before therapy. Um, I just, it's like we're, we're potentially triggering a post-traumatic response, uh, which I think we kind of see in the data is, hey, if you show me a picture of something that traumatized me and I'm coming to therapy because I know my trauma is impacting me in a negative way, boom, right? I worry about people asking questions that we re-traumatize people. Here we're, we're showing them actual pictures of not their trauma, but something I think their brains would connect very easily and bring back past memories of their own abuse. How do you think that that variable coming in there impacted all the data that came afterwards. Because if one of my first experiences volunteering to come to therapy was, Hey, now I'm part of this study and now I'm re-traumatized because I got to watch pictures of people being abused. Um, I just kind of wondered, yeah, I kind of, I had kind of a visceral ethical reaction to that. And then I took a breath and I regulated my heart rate variability and I, I was, I was okay with it. I don't know these people. Uh, but I just kind of wonder, because this is an intense, we've now, you back to back, you've given us articles where we made abuse victims watch pictures of people being abused and suffocating people. So, (laughs) Well, one thing I think about this study is the question about how much do I think it impacted the working alliance measure, um, I think was very small. And I think that from a procedural standpoint, because the the testing about seeing the slides was not connected to their therapy appointment. Right? These were therapists who weren't necessarily um, a part of this center or this study. They were from a diverse bunch of different backgrounds. And so they weren't like directly connected to, oh, you're going to come and watch these slides and then your therapy appointment is next. Yeah. So I think procedurally they addressed that and they took the measures of RSA, SCL, and uh, pre-baseline measures of symptom severity in a completely separate time, like totally separate from, from the therapy. So I think that there's very little contamination in the data from that. A- about whether or not that's an ethical thing to do, that's up to the IRB to decide. <laughs> like if they, like that's why we have that process. So uh, if they were okay with it, I, I guess it was reviewed. And, and uh, I can see your point, and, and also I can see the the value of the knowledge that came from it, um, given the level of discomfort caused, um, essentially for an IRB balanced out. Yeah, that's, that's an, it was an okay thing to do. Uh, certainly everybody has, has their own opinions about that and yeah. I'll be respectful of that for sure. So I got a, a kind of a, a, a extension to go to next from this, right? So we know that uh, traumatic exposure makes things like the dissociative process, the attentional process, the memory process, the interpersonal connection, social engagement process, it makes those things more intense or causes some barriers to those things in some of those cases. But we also know that those are processes that happen within our, us as, within each individual as a biological system, regardless of traumatic exposure. Like we all go through those things. It's just that trauma causes some problems to some of those processes. So if we take this study and could extend it beyond the subjects of this study who really had a lot of traumatic exposure and would clearly have some challenges with interpersonal connectedness, with trust, with developing shared (laughs) uh, with having a regulated stress response, 
Um, but we could, we could extend that to groups like the three of us. Like we all go through all of these processes where we have uh, at times challenges with paying attention and dissociating or having interpersonal relationships that are trusting versus not trusting. And, and we think about applying that to even to say, if this is happening between therapist and client, it's probably also happening with, let's say you had a, a group of, of therapists who had a supervisor and the therapist came in with high heart rate variability versus low heart rate variability. I'm sure they would have some differential working alliance ratings with their supervisor or the next level up or the, uh, so as we think about extending it beyond this population, what are some ways that you've seen this play out or that we could address even within our organizations and within our systems now, knowing that regulating our stress response is important to cooperative relationships within the workplace. And is that an extension that we think that we could make? So maybe I'll start with that question. Do you think we could make that leap from a study like this? Is that a reasonable direction to go? What are thoughts about that? So, so my first thought is, the, you're drawing an interesting parallel, right? Is that in all relationships, the ability for those we're engaging in socially to, one is to have um, good affect reg management, right? Emotional, to kind of look at that, to be able to be a to be able to be both attuned to their own self and to those that they're interacting with. And to use that information to develop an effective response. Could go not just to the client or to the supervisor, but to really any intimate relationship you have, mm -hmm. right? And that the reason oftentimes people are in therapy is they've struggled with that and they come in with dysregulated states, so it puts more kind of demands on the, um, the affect management and the capacity for attunement and effective on the therapist with their client, but also because therapists or case managers are hanging out with people who are dysregulated, it puts more demand on the supervisor to have responsibility to have affect management and to be able to be attuned and develop effective questions or responses that helps that individual move to more um, an ability to be more regulated, reflective, um, and to be able to, for them to develop a, a, a effective response to their own state. So I, I think that you're raising two issues. One is, is, the, is there a parallel process? And I think yes. But two is, where does the burden of responsibility fall in that relationship that they're not equals, right? So I'm not an equal to my client. I'm not an equal when I'm with my supervisor. My supervisor has more responsibility to kind of look at that. But when I'm home in other relationships, there's more of an equality to kind of looking at that piece. So I think the nature, when I'm a parent, it's not, I don't expect my kids to regulate me, although sometimes I wish they would. But it, it, so I think what, what it, it kind of looks at is where does that burden of responsibility really fall? Mm -hmm. um, and that I can't really be attuned unless I'm regulated because I'm not engaged, right? And then I can't really come up with a really effective strategy to intervene unless I've been regulated and attuned because I've got to figure out what this in person needs. I can't just pull something off the shelf yeah. and kind of look at. So I think all, all of these things that you're mentioning are really important um, pieces of all caring relationships. I mean, there's a, there's a, I don't know if the study has been done. I'm not aware of it, if it has, but um, taking measures of, of say heart rate variability or autonomic regulation and somebody's ability to engage in attuned relationships with, uh, with a client or with a supervisee may be a really kind of interesting other side of the coin study from even from this one, like putting those two groups measures together and watching the interplay between the two on, on something like working alliance would be a pretty interesting question to wow. start to explore. Matt, what do you think? 
Well, I mean, I think, you know, in some ways, you know, it's, it's such a tricky thing because, I, and Jerry, I think you've verbalized it really well so far, is in some ways all this stuff on heart rate variability tells us what we kind of already knew. Like, it, it's another support. It's like, we know folks with unresolved trauma, especially compound or complex trauma, that their amygdalas will be bigger, you know? So, so it's, it's kind of like, yeah, we know that. So, you know, you know but when I, I think about what this adds to the workplace environment, if I could just kind of hit, hit that again from, again, maybe looking at manager to supervisee sort, sort of relationship, is that if you know, you know, if you if, get it, technology is almost there. In fact, it's just so freaking close that I could see there, there was this meeting Jerry made me go to. It. Jerry showed up every once in a while. That was at three o'clock on Wednesdays. And I twitch still every time when it hits Wednesday at three o'clock. I hated this meeting. But, but I, I could just hate this meeting. And I didn't like some people in this meeting. And I hated how the meeting went. And I was just like totally dysregulated and pissed off at the world at four o'clock. Well, it was usually four twenty, four thirty, because it would always go long. Um, and then storm out was from my kids so I could ride my bike home and get all my stress out. But but I think if if I just think about that one meeting, which which wasn't really all that bad, but for drama's sake, let's say it was terrible, because sometimes it was. You know, if I would have had some insight on my physiology uh, going into that meeting. If I could track my physiological during the meeting, what I think this all allows us to do is saying, okay, I need to try this intervention at this time. And that's where I think this is really potentially groundbreaking for medicine, for psychology, for behavioral management, for education, is that if, if we can get the richness of data, which is most of us are carrying around in our phone right now. Then again, the, the technology is also telling us, hey, you may want to think about doing X, Y, and Z right now. And if I went into management I mean, and realized my heart rate variability is already pretty high because I've already had a stressful day, maybe some negative interactions already, I might just walk in with the awareness is I, I may just want to really focus on listening during this, this meeting as much as I can, that, that my input right now might not be as positive as it I normally want it to be. So, so this insight and, you know, the, the fact that some of the software is saying, okay, this is where you're at. Here's some strategies to help you deal with this. <laughs> um, you know, I think it, I think it changed it. as a manager. I would love to see, you know, and it's interesting asking from data of your biology, because I think there's some questions there to be answered still. But I think if you approach it in an ethical way, I think, you know, I could really help people that I supervise come up with better strategies, especially short term interventions for states. Traits are a whole different thing, which this has an impact. But hey, you're having a bad day. What do we need to do in the 10 minutes between UC clients to, to at least make sure the best self you can possibly bring to the next client walks into that room for that, that session or that, that appointment? So, I, you know, again, the technology is an inch away from where and it's affordable. So, so I think this changes almost, this is a game changer, I think, if we can do it the right way. Matt, so technology is an inch away. Yeah. But how could we use this knowledge and, and go into a meeting and ask people, right? Because engagement is so important yeah. in a, in a decision-making, a process to do it, to go through a ritual of just stopping and reflecting on where are they at and how ready – I, am I really to participate in this meeting in a meaningful way, right? Yeah. Is that what you're raising is, yes, later on, maybe we could get really inexpensive me physiological measurements. Yeah. But in the meantime, we could use subjective experiences to help us be more in, uh, in, in tune with our own and then effectively communicate it with our team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, space we're in. So I think you're, yeah. you're raising a really good point um, about a ritual for how to maybe run a meeting or maybe even end a meeting. 
Yeah. And, and I think uh, Dr. Bloom does a great job, her community meetings. And I know some people hate those community meetings. I've heard so many people rail against those more than love them. But you know what, what I took away from hers, even though I don't think you necessarily need to go as deep and intense because it takes up the whole minute if you got a bunch of us therapists in the room together, but just checking in on how you feel or have maybe something that, that, you, that you can like maybe a three-sided dice of, hey, green, I'm just ready to rock and roll, expect my best. Yellow, eh, you know, I'm okay, but, you know, I may need a little bit more time to process thing in red. Hey, you know, I'm going to do some deep breathing and listen the best I can. So I think that there's, yeah, j- just those little things. And you're right, Jerry, to a point where there, there is that subjective experience where I could say red, yellow, green, mostly right. But, but the thing that I, I'm surprised with is the heart rate variability gives you a very objective measure. And sometimes you know, the objective measure gives me additional insight w- that my subjective measure doesn't give. And, and I think, so, right. so I think that there's a way to, uh, to check in just, and it, right. again, it's another so, level. I, of I that, 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 that I wonder, you know, I, I'm using a golf analogy, right? When I go out on, when I go out on a golf course or I take a golf lesson, the instructor goes through a very slow um, process of lining me up that does it. And what he wants to do is get me to be aware of that experience in my body of being in the right stance, right? So over time, repetition, I actually become aware when I'm not in that stance. And so I wonder, as you use this heart rate monitor variability more frequently, whether there'll be more alignment between your subjective experience of heart rate and that what that measure is telling you, because you begin to get feedback. Yeah. And, so, and I, what, what's your thought about that? As you get more feedback, do you get better at reading your own physiological states? Yeah, one, one absolutely. Oh, go ahead, Kurt. I, I'm going to say one would hope that you do. And I, and I think one of the, I think Matt's, one of Matt's points is a really great one. And we, as we think about applying this to say a work environment, I think in a work environment is a place where the subjective measure can be a really, really effective one. Because then we're dealing with a population of people in general. I mean, this is a very general statement who have the ability to verbalize and with some accuracy, their internal state. And one of the ways that this can be applied so well to individuals with a lot of trauma in their history is that the ability to verbalize internal states is really compromised. And so having a measure uh, like this that is being attuned to an internal state to somebody who cannot give you the subjective information can just be, uh, as Matt, I think you, I, I agree with you on that. That can be a game changer yeah. of being able to do that with somebody who cannot give you the subjective information. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, to just add to that too, I, I think, you know, Jerry, your question of, yeah, I'm paying more attention to the subjective experience of, of what the, what the measures are telling me. And I think, uh, but at the same time, I'm, I'm learning that, so let's just take relaxation. I think I shared last time is I love this game civilization, but my heart rate variability scores go to shit uh, when I play it for eight hours straight. Um, so I, so I, I'm checking to see, okay, I'm, if I'm gonna play this game, how am I feeling right now? I don't think yeah, you need to be socially see. engaged when you're playing eight hours. I'm very engaged. I'm very engaged. <laughs> like heart rate very low heart rate variability is fine in that game. Yes, yes. Because people are trying to hurt you and you're trying to make everybody happy and give everybody religion and stuff. It's stressful. Uh, these people, people after you spend eight, ten hours leading them. Uh, but but I didn't realize the game was stressing me out. I, I could tell you, well, maybe playing this for ten hours straight on a Saturday might not be the healthiest way of my time. But you know. I, I looked at my weekly scores and my Saturdays were one of the most stressful days of my entire week. And so I've, I've stopped playing that and I don't do anything halfway. So it's either all on playing 10 hours straight in a binge or not doing it ever again. And you know, I, I feel more refreshed this Monday than I have in the past. Again, so I think that, I think we're, we're right. I, I agree with everything about the subjective experience, but I think that there's, we, we also can trick ourselves sometimes. We can justify. And I think our heart rate variability 
calls our bluff sometimes. Um, because, you know, if you ask me, do you hate going into this meeting? I'd, I'd probably say, if Jerry asked me that, I'd probably sugarcoat it at least. And I'd probably be saying that to myself because I, I wouldn't want to admit I didn't like that meeting as much as I didn't like it. But my heart rate variability doesn't lie in that same way. So I think that there's so much insight also to be had there that, that again, in a workplace, again, I think client, therapist, client, there, there's so much, you know, as we've talked about in potential impacts there, but, but I, I see this as a, would be an invaluable tool to measure team health, to measure effectiveness of meetings, and potentially again, to, to just give kind of, we, we use these kind of brain things of, hey, I'm a purple or anagrams or whatever they are. I, I'm, I'm a wizard or a warrior, you know, we, we do all these, things i'm a blue brain you're a purple brain and my other things are gray brain and it's like hey uh, my heart rate variability is low right now i think that gives you a again it, you know we can supplement these other measures but i think hey if i want to know one thing when i'm sitting around with a group of eight people trying to problem solve i kind of want to know how your heart rate variability is right now so one thing i love about your your example of playing the game and ha having an impact on an important measure of your overall social, emotional, behavioral, like physical health, mm -hmm. is that it helps you to make a decision yeah. about what you want to do in the short term. Yes. And it's going to have long-term consequences that you may not have known otherwise. So Absolutely. it helps you to make a more effective, immediate decision that otherwise you may not have known. Yeah. Without having both the measure and the understanding of all of the things that this measure is related to in terms of your overall functioning. And I think that's a great thing to get out of having knowledge about, a, you know, a body of knowledge about something like this. That's a great cognitive intervention and it's a great physiological regulatory intervention. I think it really hits on a couple of key points there. Yeah, and I would support that if you find yourself doing anything for 10 hours straight on a weekend, it's probably not good for your heart rate. <laughs> <laughs> Guess that depends on how long a round of golf lasts, Jerry. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can tell you my heart rate variability on the golf course. Isn't really <laughs> yeah, I mean, but but uh, I mean, the other thing too that that, that uh, I think, and you mentioned this, Kurt, a couple times is there's days where even though one of the things we're told and I internalize is, hey, if you have a stressful day at work, the best thing you can do is go to the gym and work out. And I still think that there's, as a generalized statement working out is a very positive thing on so many different levels. But there might be days where my body's holding so much uh, stress or exhaustion that it might not be the best thing for me to do. It might be better for me to take a long walk instead of go hitting the, you know, the exercise bike for, uh, for a, a 90 minute intense workout. And so, you know, I think that this, the science can also give us a more objective reading where what we've learned might not always be the best intervention. So I think that that's another thing for ourselves. And I just think about with our patients and clients with this as well, is again, the technology might be an inch away, but if they can get readings with suggestions of, hey, the best thing you might be able to do tonight is just to, to veg out on the couch, just relax. That's what right. your body needs. Right. The, the, other, the other thing that as you were talking, I think, is this ability to um, to assign intention to people, mm -hmm. and that when somebody comes to therapy and they're not engaged with you, um, it's either there's something wrong with them or there's something not, not I'm not doing right well. And I think when you have a physiological measure, you could stay more um, empathetically connected to that individual um, in that it, I'm not going to attribute it to some um, kind of variable that's really not meaningful to what actually is happening in the room. So I, I think that what you're talking about in whether it be a work meeting or therapy is what's actually going on in that meeting as people are getting like irritating and doing and somebody's kind of May, you know, non-verbally begins to communicate, there's something wrong with you, or I don't like you, or I don't, right? This allows us to hold our relational connectedness to each other 
um, by having some empathy for, for and some compassion for, for the uh, individual. Yeah. Well, and, and I know we're kind of running out of time here, but, but I do want to ask one question on this. Would, would you suggest, again, technologies, you know, not everybody, especially those we serve, have smartphones to do this. So I, I get that. But if we could get help people take measurements and, and again, connect them to this technology that's, that's a good way there, I wonder the other thing too, as we talk about objective versus subjective measures is I, I wonder what you would think about is doing journaling or whatever that looks like for the individual about, okay, you know, I'm measuring my heart rate variability when I wake up middle of the day in the evening, what's it feel like to have a high heart rate variability or a low heart rate variability? Is there some benefit? Because I don't know if we've touched on this as much of really helping people connect subjectively with what, um, the bio measures are telling us. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a great pattern with that kind of process you described, Matt, which is really important to teaching about self-regulation. Yeah. And so self-regulation often is thought of as, um, we teach people when I'm up, what do I do to get down? Or when I'm down, what do I do to get up? Which is the cognitive step of self-regulation. Mm -hmm. And that's not, you can't get to the cognitive step if you don't, have the ability to be aware of the state of your own body and then to make relative judgments about it. Mm -hmm. Those are the two key steps before you get to the step of being able to make a decision about if I'm up, what do I do to get down? Like all of that, those two processes are really important to the learning of that and checking in with your internal state and getting a number is a really great intervention for that first process of being able to check in with my internal state. And then because it's a number, it's easy for us to make relative judgments. Is it higher or relatively lower? Is it an 89 or is it a 92? Then you can start to make that relative judgment piece of it, which is really critical steps to getting to that third step. And show some improvement as well. I mean, I think it would be cool for people to, again, you'd have to look over over time, but you know, my, my heart rate variability is getting better, a little bit better each, each week. You know, Margaret, Margaret Blaustein um, in her ARC model talks about check-ins where she asks people, um, what's your energy level, right? Mm -hmm. Just stop for a moment, check your energy level. Second question she asks is, is that energy level comfortable for you? Yeah. And then the third one is, is this energy level that's either comfortable or uncomfortable going to be helpful for you in carrying out the task we have in front of us, mm -hmm. right? So you could say is, I'm in this state, but I'm uncomfortable with it, and I can't do the task, or I'm in a state and I'm comfortable with it, but it really isn't very good for me to do this task, but I feel really good about this being in the state, right? And so I, I think there's both this issue of the awareness of the state but there's also some desire to, and, a, and a, an ability to reflect that maybe that state's not a good state to be in for this. And those are not the same processes, mm -hmm. right? So oftentimes if I'm really pissed off and I'm coming in a meeting and I'm really angry and I'm probably not in a good spot, I might say, I'm really happy that I'm pissed off right now and I'm really in a good, right, to do it. and. I'm not really in a good spot to do the meeting, but I may not have that ability to have that reflection. Yeah. And your clients may not have that as well. So in again, there's both this issue of getting the measurement and then the issue of what's my motivation to make change to that process. Absolutely. To, to, to look at it. So you're very motivated, Matt. You get this feedback and say, oh, I wanna change it to do it. That's another stage of the change process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's absolutely. Yeah. Right? So again is giving the feedback, helping them hope, and then you, that's where maybe your, your motivational interviewing comes in, is playing how is this current state helping you and how is it getting in the way for you? So you can kind of help that individual get to the spot where they're motivated to make some changes in their lives. Absolutely. And, and I, I do some very, teach some very similar with the, the cup analogy that we mentioned on the show is where, where's your cup at today? Because I exactly. think sometimes analogies, people are just simplified, 
you know, uh, representations that, that are sometimes easier, but to, to check in in that, that way as well. Right. And, right. And you know, kind of I, I, for these articles, by the way. They're what's that? They've been great ones, haven't they? It's been really yeah. fun discussions for sure. We got one more left to go, don't we? I can pick one more. All right. Well, uh, I think we'll wrap it up for this week, but we have one more in this series. Uh, then, then we have, I uh, actually got the book right here. I'm going through, we have, uh, uh, Robert Mahler, who, who uh, I don't think is the guy in D.C. investigating uh, uh, Russian involvement in our elections, but it's uh, Trauma and the Struggle to Open It Up is the book we're going to do in a couple weeks as well. So we'll do one more article on heart rate variability and then uh, have Robert Mahler on to uh, talk about, uh, I think a really the book's really interesting about how trauma closes people down. I think we mentioned that and strategies he uses to help uh, help them feel less shame, get over some of the guilt and really get, get to the work uh, being done in trauma treatment. So uh, a fun couple of weeks coming up. So um, as always, you can find show notes, discussion questions, links, uh, including the link to the article that we talked about today um, at uh, traumainformlens.org under epi- episode 70. So uh, over 70 hours of content, gentlemen, congratulations. And uh, we'll throw another episode, uh, another hour in there next week. So everybody have a wonderful week. um, And uh, we'll see you for another discussion next week. Thanks.